Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third Facebook Live event, this time discussing all things macabre. We are talking about death records, cemeteries, and witches. My name is Lindsay Fulton. I oversee all research and library services here at American Ancestors and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I want to note that we are, of course, broadcasting from home with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and thank you for your patience. Our speaker today is our chief genealogist, David Allen Lambert. David is a internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. His genealogical expertise includes New England and Atlantic Canada records from the 17th through 21st centuries, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. Mr. Lambert has published many articles in the New England Historic Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, the Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. He has also published a guide to Massachusetts cemeteries, which is very appropriate for today's event. Uh, he is also a tribal uh, genealogist for the Massachusetts Punkapog Indians of Massachusetts. David will lead today's discussion on all things macabre, highlighting death records, cemeteries, and witches. After David's short presentation, we will have time for questions from the audience. If you think of a question during today's discussion, please type it into the comment section and we will get to as many as we can in the allotted time. Okay, take it away, David. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, happy early Halloween, everyone. So I thought this would be appropriate to uh, give these topics to you as you prepare for your virtual Halloween. So in genealogy, you know, some things can be very scary. Sometimes it's your DNA results and sometimes it's waiting for that cousin to finally drop an email back to you with that photo of your great grandmother you know she has. But for me, it starts here in Boston and American ancestors. As you may know, the New England Historic Genealogical Society has been around since 1845. We're 175 years old. We look pretty good, don't you think? <laughs> this is just an example of some of the type of books that we have at the library, not specifically our shelves, but to give you the idea that some of the scariest things in genealogy aren't the ghosts that walk in cemeteries. No, they're the books on the shelves. These are books that you probably have at home. In the 19th century, genealogies were done by correspondence. Someone would send you a letter, they would get the information, they'd record it. What's the primary source? Well, the person who wrote the letter. This is where I came across my first ghost story. This is a memoir on genealogy of John Poor, written in 1881 by Alfred Poor, who was a resident uh, member of the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston, right here where I work. Uh, Alfred Poor, of course, had the limitations of no DNA test, no online access to any databases like American Ancestors. We have a billion searchable records. I'm sure he would have appreciated that when he put this book together. He did it all by correspondence. So you can't fault genealogists of the past. So we're gonna talk about death records. So let me show you one. For me to learn about my 10th great grandfather, I had to look at this entry here in the published genealogy. It is an inventory of his personal estate was taken to find his deceased to be about November 21st, 1684. Tradition says he was out hunting, losing his way, perished in the cold and the hunger in the woods near Andover, and then he died. Well, John Poor's death date has never been really a certain. We know that he went off hunting and that probably by the 24th of November when there was a court of inquiry into his death, may probably obviously had already died. Now, the problem we have now is that we're dealing with vital records that are not as complete as we have in the 21st century, let alone even the 19th or 20th century. So how do I find out about John Poor? What would you do? Well, I know what you do if you're doing Massachusetts records. Hopefully you're going to AmericanAncestors.org and using one of our databases, including the Mass Vital Records to 1850. So death records and cemeteries are just one of the main topics that we have at American Ancestors that can help you break down your brick walls. 
So for John Poor, I know that in 1684, he died. So I did a search on our database and John Poor dying in 1684 popped up and it says that it's in volume two, uh, page 703. Well, that's nice. I have the citation, but I want to see the image. So I can easily click on view image and it allows me to actually see the entry. Here's John, the second entry on page 703. John died November 23rd, 1684. Now, some people would stop there, and that's obviously a perfectly valid source if you were going to join a hereditary society, but I like to go to the original source. So what did I do? I went looking, and I went and tried to find the source that the Newbery Vital Record book that was published in the early 20th century, where they came from. This is a copy of it, but wait a second, this doesn't really work. So if you look down here, the third to last entry is John Poor died November 23rd, 1684. Well, the date's right. Looks like these are all deaths that occurred in January of 1684 to uh, November of 1684. What's the problem? This isn't a 17th century record. This is no doubt something that was copied over in the 19th century from the original record. And I wanna go that one step further. And that's what I can do. I can look for records. May it be on microfilm at American Ancestors or maybe through familysearch.org or maybe it's contacting the town clerk itself. I wanna be able to find the original source and I did, this is it. Wow, that's a lot more hard to read than the published book, wasn't it? Well, if you look with that red and black arrows, you can see John Poor died, D-Y-E-D, -E November 23rd, 84. Obviously 1684 is listed above. So this was the first time that my ancestor's death was written down. So we have the variance of going from that to this version in the 19th century to the published version, and of course now searchable on American ancestors. It's nice, but now what it does is ask more questions. So now I know John Poor died between November 21st and November 23rd. Remember, the court of inquiry was six, uh, the 24th uh, of November 1684 from his published federal record. John Poor's death, I may never exactly know, but I do have a range and I can at least cite it to the published book or the, the actual original record that's in the Newbury Town Hall that I was able to see digital images of. So what do we do next? We give you something exciting that I only found recently. This is a little bit of a quote to send a chill and maybe give you a smile and a warm and fuzzy feeling all at once. Within this book, you may behold both great and small, both young and old, who at ye last must quit ye field, and to grim doth their bodies yield. Let all henceforward that may look for deaths recorded in this book, get ready and prepared to die, that they may live eternally with God in Christ in heaven above, where is perfect peace and joy and love. This was recorded in the book started in 1711 in the vital records of Newbury. I'd love to know who wrote that one down, but I'll tell you, it does make you think. Now, American Ancestors has over a billion searchable records. And of course, the organization started in 1845 in Boston, Massachusetts. And we're very lucky in Massachusetts. We have very early records, as you can see from the 1600s. We're also the first state to mandate the requirement of every city and town to send their birth, marriage, and deaths in. And this starts back in 1841. So let's take a ride over to the vital record database on American ancestors. And here we are, we can place in a search. Hey, I got a great idea. Since it's Halloween, maybe I'm a zombie. Let's go and search for a death record for me. So David Lambert put in death, hit search. Oh my goodness, there I am. Well, not me, but obviously another David Lambert. So if I click on this one here from Shirley, Massachusetts in 1890, I can pull up the actual image itself, get the citation, and if I hit view, the original digitized record, either from microfilm or original will show up, and I can actually look at the record right on my screen. So one of the nice things that I find about genealogy is that you can look at the original source, you can also zoom in of the record. You can save the image. You can print it out. There's any possibility of things that you could do on American Ancestors. So this David Lambert is the son of Theophilo and M. Murray Lambert. And he was a laborer and uh, both his parents are from Canada. 
So this is just a little bit of information about him. So how about if I want to try one of the other databases? Now, if you notice something about this, this isn't a death certificate. This is a ledger of deaths that were recorded. Sometimes there will have an actually a complete page, but these were the, the transcripts that were sent exactly what the town had to the Secretary of State's office in Massachusetts. Now, if I go back to American Ancestors main page by clicking on the oak leaf right here, I can go to search, browse databases. Well, let's put in the word vital. Well, if you go here, there are 121 databases that have the word vital in it. So for vital records, you could try for New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, wherever you may want and see if we have it. We also have databases that are unique to one particular town. And for this case, I wanna look at the later Massachusetts vital records. So if I go here, there's Massachusetts vital records, 1916 to 1920. Since I like a challenge, I'm gonna just put in a search for Thomas Smith. I'm probably sure that you might have a Smith in your family tree, one of your collaterals. It probably makes you kind of stressed from time to time. So let's see how scary this search will get. So I'm doing a search on a Thomas Smith from 1917, selecting death and hit search. Now, at this point in time, there is a change of vital records over from a ledger form to actual certificates. And the certificates are gonna give you a broad range of information that the ledgers don't have. Do you remember that David Lambert death a couple of minutes ago? Yeah, didn't have a place of burial. They didn't start putting those in into the latter part of the 19th century. And then even in that case, it would just say place of death, residence, and place of interment. Now you might get the cemetery name, but sometimes you might just get the town that they're buried in. So in this case, the process got better. In the case of the older records, just a tip, you contact the city or town that the death occurred in for those early 1841 to say 1890s deaths, the city or town clerk should have their original, which should say the cemetery on it. So going through here, I've got Thomas Smith, 1917 in Chelsea. And instead of a ledger sheet, I am now actually able to see an actual certificate. So here's a certificate. Uh, and it gives me that his age is 40. Looks like probably one I could look at that would might give me some clues into who this adult is. And when the record pulls up on my screen, I will be able to see that Thomas Smith was a resident on a barge. On a barge? Well, that makes sense because he's a seaman in the Merchant Marines. He died at the US Marine Hospital in Chelsea, Massachusetts. He's born in Nova Scotia. Parents unknown, birthplace unknown, mother's name unknown, where she's born unknown. Sound kind of familiar? It's a really scary situation in genealogy when you have ditto marks. <laughs> so he died January 13th, 1917, of just a couple of months before we entered into World War I in April of that year. And he died of uh, heart disease. And what do we know? Well, we know in it now that he's buried at Woodlawn Cemetery. And a Google search will tell me that Woodlawn Cemetery is in Everett, Massachusetts, which is right near Chelsea. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm actually going to go in and I'm going to search for something that would be beneficial to doing cemetery records. And for that, cemetery transcriptions are a wonderful thing, but we're gonna to go to find a grave first. So if I go in to find a grave, I can go in and I can search for Thomas. And I'm gonna put the year of death of 1917. And I'm gonna put Woodlawn. Now, one disclaimer, there are also other wonderful websites for your cemetery research. I use Find a Grave personally because I put over 10,000 gravestones in it over the past decade or more. Billion Graves is wonderful. There's internment.net. There are a variety of things that it might be out there, even if it's a small town historical society. So it doesn't have to be one-stop shopping, but I too use Find a Grave and Billion Graves quite a bit. So if I put in Woodlawn and then I continue to type it, I can now put in, I'm sorry, I don't want to put in the cemetery name. If I put in Everett, Massachusetts, in Middlesex County, I do my search and voila, there's an entry for Thomas Smith in 1917. Now, what's really kind of nice about this, I have more information 
So somebody put a skeletal record, probably went through and put something uh, additional in there. I can uh, suggest edits. I can even request a photograph to have, or maybe if I found the gravestone for Thomas, I can add that or maybe a photograph of himself or maybe the ship that he was on or maybe even the place he died. So find a grave may be something that you may find beneficial. Now, I wanna show you that on American Ancestors, We've taken a lot of time to collect cemetery transcriptions. That's a lot of hours walking around cemeteries in 175 years. And it's not just our staff that did this, it's our members. Since 1845, we were received in our over 28 million manuscripts, thousands of cemetery transcriptions with thousands upon thousands of names within it. This allows you to look at a database that covers 1650 to 2000 of a variety of different cemetery databases available. So you can search on a name and a location and get it right there. So if I wanna look for just the Lamberts in this collection, there I go. And they're not just Massachusetts. We've got New Vineyard, Maine. We've got San Francisco, California. Um, so there's some, really diverse little collections in here. And these could be inscriptions of a cemetery that has five gravestones or 500 gravestones. Now I'm gonna go back to the oak leaf and talk about one more collaboration. American Ancestors is delighted to be uh, partnered with the Archdiocese of Boston. The archives has some tremendous collections and their cemetery records are amazing. The earliest Roman Catholic cemetery in Massachusetts, the St. Augustine Cemetery in South Boston, it started back in 1819. So if I go to our databases and I put in St. Augustine's, just type it in. I can search for any number of people that may be buried there. Now there's a lot of things on our databases, as you see, uh, transcriptions for cemeteries are typically, you know, a handwritten or a typed up list. This little database is a little bit more. So I'm going to search for a Thomas Barrett that I know has an old gravestone out there. And if I do a search, I will now find that there are a variety of entries between transcriptions as well as actual inventory sheets. Yeah, so I actually am not on find a grave right now. I'm on American Ancestors looking at an inventory sheet about the condition, what type of stone this is, as well as a photograph of the gravestone that I can see right on my screen. So American Ancestors is pleased to bring you both death records as well as some cemetery records. Now, I also wanna tell you about the American genealogist. And why I'm gonna tell you about that is because we're gonna to go to our next subject right now. This is one commercial break though, before we jump to witches, and I'll tell you why American genealogist is great. I hope that you might consider getting my guide to Massachusetts cemeteries available from American ancestors. It's both in book form as well as ebook form. The ebook allows you to click on the cemetery name and it takes you directly to find a grave where you can search and see if there's already a picture of that gravestone before you get in that car ride and drive to Massachusetts. Well, I hope that after COVID and you do drive to Massachusetts, you come and visit them. American Ancestors here on Newbury Street in Boston. Uh, the cemetery guide is arranged in such a way by town, the oldest date of a gravestone in the cemetery or the date the cemetery was incorporated. You'll also find the address, you'll find manuscript references for everything on American Ancestors, as well as the manuscript citations for the Daughters of the American Revolution Library in Washington, DC, which the DAR have done a tremendous job over the past hundred years transcribing gravestones of memorials of Revolutionary War veterans and patriots, as well as their families and associates. Witches. Well, one of the things about Halloween is that maybe someone in your family has dressed up as a witch. Well, in my family, we didn't do that so much because the story of my 10th great grandmother was still kind of echoed into the memory of what happened. See, I descend from Mary Perkins Bradbury, who was accused of witchcraft. And I promise you, that's not her. A modern day witch or someone who even practices Wicca, I completely embrace whatever you want to do, even on Halloween. <laughs> But I descend from a witch that was persecuted in the time where spectral evidence sought to end life, take the property, destroy the reputation of a family. Um, the Bradbury's lucked out. 
uh, the town that she was from, uh, Salisbury, Massachusetts, sent a petition to stop her from being another victim at the gallows. So thank you, descendants of those who signed a petition to save my ancestor's life. That includes the author, Nathaniel Philbrook, whose ancestor signed that petition. So what if your ancestor was involved in the witchcraft hysteria? Maybe you had an ancestor that was a witch or was accused to be a witch. Well, she definitely wasn't a witch, but you may have had somebody on the jury. You may have had one of the afflicted that were pointing the accusations, or you may have had someone who sat on the court, the judge. Now, the judge Samuel Sewell is the brother of my ancestor, Ann Sewell Longfellow, and he is the only one that recanted. The town I grew up in, Stoughton, is named for Chief Justice William Stoughton, the chief magistrate during the trials who never recanted for his decisions. Now, Massachusetts, the Salem witchcraft trials, Europe also had many, many decades upon decades of witch hunts and the burning of witches in Europe. They were hanged and of course, poor George Jacobs was crushed in Salem during his um, trial. But University of Virginia is the place to go. It is one of the greatest collections of digital images on the witchcraft trial that I've seen by far in all the years of my researching. You can go to salem.lib.virginia.edu.home.html. This you can find documents. This includes court records. These are some of these are actual transcriptions of Salem witchcraft papers, the records of the quarterly court of Essex County, which you'll also incidentally find on AmericanAncestors.org, but the original court records, and not just from one place, from the Boston Public Library, from the Maine Historical Society, the Massachusetts State Archives, the Massachusetts Historical Society. So let's look what's at the Mass Historical Society, which is the parent organization of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, which I work for. So you go in here, you can find documents like this one for George Burroughs, it's an arrest warrant. And there's the original record right on your screen. You can hit next and it'll turn to the back of the document or maybe there's more writing to be continued. As you can see, there's just a variety of documents and this is just one of the repositories. That's from the Mass Historical Society. If I go back here, I can also go to the home button and I can select notable people. For instance, I can go here and pick somebody who was accused of witchcraft, uh, or maybe there's a judge, or maybe some other person connected to the trials. Let's look at Giles Corey. And I, incidentally, I take it as uh, Giles Corey uh, was the one that was uh, pressed because of the, uh, the weight. It wasn't George Jacobs. The case file referring Giles Corey, and then you have Testimony of Giles Corey versus Martha Corey, examination of Sarah Close and Elizabeth Proctor, deposition of Benjamin Gould. Any of these documents, you click on them. There we go. The deposition, and there's the original document right there that you can scan, scan and have on your screen. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about death records. We've talked about cemeteries, my, one of my favorite subjects. And we've talked about the bittersweet story of the poor unfortunate during the Salem witchcraft trials. And of course, we've also kind of talked a little bit, you know, about Halloween. Well, I wanna share some upcoming things before Halloween and afterwards. Before Halloween, you've had a chance to check out this video and I hope that you share it with others and that you enjoy it. Uh, but we have some free programs coming up on American ancestors and that includes stories from the archives, objects of mourning. That's with our archivist, Judy Lucy. And this is gonna contain letters of condolence. It's gonna have coffin plates, mourning jewelry, embroidered memorials, all sorts of things that talk about that one last chapter in someone's life. And of course, the morning of the deceased. This is on November 5th from 3 to 4 p.m. And I'm going to show you the website so you can register. And again, it's free. Another webinar you may be interested in is Jewish and American, African American cemeteries as borders uncrossed. This is by Dr. Cami Fletcher and Dr. Alan Amanek. This is another free webinar. This is on December 1st from 4 to 5 p.m. as a partnership 
with the Weiner Jewish, Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center events. So you can go on to AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes and find out more about exciting programming for 2020 and the coming 2021, both virtual and hopefully some in-person events soon. Now, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a scary story. You know, we all have these stories in genealogy. Maybe there's a ghost in your family tree that keeps haunting you. Maybe it's that ancestor you can't find. Maybe you feel something's following you when you go into a cemetery in New England on a chilly fall evening. Or maybe, just maybe, that scariest image that comes up in your head is yourself in 1974 at Halloween. Yes, David Allen Lambert, AKA Thunderman. This is me when I was five years old back in Halloween of 1974. Uh, we were up in Maine. We had a campsite that we'd go up to and the weather was still pretty good, but <laughs> the week we went up thunderstorms all over the place. So when we were there, they decided to have a holiday parade. The weather broke and my mother made a costume for me as Thunderman with a tinfoil crown and a pan and a spoon. I walked the streets of the campground with making noise and probably with the most scariest, obnoxious costume my mother could humanly make for me. So yes, folks, this is the scariest photo in my family history collection. And I hope it doesn't give you nightmares, but I thought I'd share it with you. Any questions, if you dare, if not, you can reach to me at dalambert at nehs.org. Just put uh, in the subject matter, uh, all things macabre, and I will be more than happy to reference and I'll know it came from this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So we have some questions uh, from folks that were in the audience. If we'll take a moment of your time. Um, we have a question from a fellow David. Oh. And he is asking, uh, he's having an issue with find a grave. Uh, and he says that I have a fourth cousin who added a listing for my maternal great grandparents, but in the wrong cemetery. Uh, the cousin put them in Nauvoo in Illinois. Yeah. And sometimes oh, someone correctly recorded their graves with photos of headstones in the right cemetery at find a grave. So how do we fix that issue? You know, that happens. I've seen that a couple of cases in my own family research where someone uh, presumes someone was buried there. But in this case, you have a photograph. So you know, they're finally there. Of course, the grave could have moved too. That's entirely possible. So what you really want to do is if you go on, I'm just going to pull up find a grave real quick again, you can go into this suggest edit section. And the suggest edits may put in a notes field that you can suggest an other correction. And that's generally what I do when there's an error in it. Um, so if you do that, um, also know that Find a Grave is owned and operated by Ancestry.com. And I'm sure their help uh, would evaluate any major problems that you have. Uh, occasionally what happens is people will make a contribution and put up a grave and well, maybe they're in Find a Grave now themselves <laughs> because you know people don't live forever. So uh, there are a lot of times contributions that are made that are in error or they're in the wrong cemetery that they can be fixed only by the administrators of Find a Grave. So uh, great question, David. Thanks. We have another one, uh, David, from Chris, um, and this is this is going moving on to to death records. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Chris has a second great grandfather who died in Haverhill, Massachusetts in 1901. Okay. So he has his death certificate, but the problem is it doesn't list where he's buried. So his question is, um, where can he find out where, where he might be buried? And it would might be helpful for you to know that the, he's found the place that the wife is buried and she's buried with her second husband. Okay. Well, you know, it's interesting because by 1901, Lindsay, the Mass Federal Records are supposed to include that column that says place of residence, place of death, and place of interment. And remember that the copies that we're looking at generally are the copies sent to the state. And of course, it's the city or town clerk either had to type it or hand write all of that information. It's possible that they accidentally omitted something from the original. So my advice would be to contact the city of Haverhill, Massachusetts and send them the information you have and say, could you please look at your records to see if it says the town at least 
or the place that he is buried. The only other instance that may come up is if he was like um, on a vessel and his body was never found. Um, it's possible they didn't have a place of interment, but maybe there's a cenotaph memorial and a cemetery or in a church for him as well. But I would start first by contacting Haverhill City Hall, the city clerk's office and seeing if they could look at that 1901 death record, the one that they originally took, not the one that was sent to the Secretary of State's office, which is now on American Ancestors and the originals are at the Mass State Archives. Great, that's great advice, thanks. Uh, and then uh, our, our final, it seems like our final question is from Ernest and Ernest is asking, um, thank you, Ernest, for asking about David's book. Um, he's wondering, in your book, does it include family cemeteries? Oh, it does. In fact, it doesn't matter, Ernest, how big the cemetery is. If there's one gravestone that is for an individual uh, that died of, say, smallpox, and it's buried out in the back of somebody's backwoods, uh, there's a gravestone, or better yet, they don't even have a gravestone. They know that there's a walled-in section. I include those. I've even included cemeteries that are no more, that have been either destroyed uh, by accident or they've been moved. Uh, so like the Quabbin Reservoir, for instance, in Massachusetts, all the drowned towns like Enfield, et cetera. I have the list of the original cemeteries. And of course, those have all been moved to another cemetery, most of them in Ware, Massachusetts. So yeah, they're included. And it doesn't matter to me if there's a gravestone with one person or a thousand people. I want to know about it. And the third edition of the cemetery book has been a labor of love um, over the past years. I started this as a Rolodex back in the 1980s. So it's a work in progress still. And I welcome any additions, corrections, uh, or subtractions. So <laughs> if you have a cemetery that you found in my book that you don't see, let me know. I'll make it in the fourth edition, I promise you. Great, thank you. Um, we don't seem to have any other questions, but I'm sure that some will come up uh, as, as time goes on. So uh, as David said, please feel free to send him an email. Uh, it's dalambert at nehgs.org. Um, and he will do his best to answer uh, your questions about all things macabre. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Before you uh, leave the event, please leave your thoughts in the comments section to give us some feedback. As we continue to expand our Facebook Live events and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. Our next Facebook Live event will be about Mayflower resources and American ancestors. This is scheduled just in time for Thanksgiving on November 20th. Uh, again, we're gonna do that from three to four uh, East Coast time. In this presentation, you will hear about all of the one-of-a-kind databases and resources that we have here at American Ancestors. And if you can't get enough of us and you'd like to engage even more with us on social media, we have a Twitter chat and that happens every Tuesday afternoon. Uh, our next topic is going to be voter history, of course. Uh, and if you would like to learn a little bit more about that, you can uh, use the hashtag Our Ancestors on Twitter to see some of our past chats as well as our future chats. Finally, if you uh, Finally, if you'd like to access more of our how-to resources and uh, learn more about our upcoming online education programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now. Happy Halloween.